Yes. Well, it's okay. It's a function of how quickly we can get the customers. Okay, so it's a, the answer is a flexible answer, and you know the you know obviously once we like as far as far as the ability to get from the existing terminals, those are real easy deals. Okay, um, but uh, it's this the, the capex for what I mentioned on uh, uh, redoing the cryogenic plants. You're talking about 20 to 25 million dollars per plant, 30 max, and Boone Pickens spent almost 100 million dollars at his plant out in Boron, and we're talking about an equivalent capacity of about 240,000 gallons a day. So for one third the capex that he spent, we can do the same thing in a much better location. He went to Boron, California, because that's probably the only place he could get that thing permitted in California. It's like 40 miles east of Bakersfield, it's in the middle of nowhere. He has to drive LNG across the San Gabriel Mountains, is that what they call those mountains? Basically from north of Los Angeles, he goes due south, across the mountains, all the way down to the Port of Long Beach and the Port of Los Angeles, where his biggest customers are, which are the drayage trucks. So he's got 130 mile one way, so he's got a 260 mile round trip. Okay, well this process, this one here, which I can't really talk about, uh, we're dealing with five different uh, opportunities in the LA Basin, industrial facilities that already exist, that are already permitted. Okay, so we won't have, you know, he's got to go 130 miles, we're right there. So, um, you know, uh, but the answer as to how many this will require, it's going to be a function of how fast we can bring the market on. But I will tell you this, uh, the opportunities, you know, the opportunities to do, to, to, to access the supply at the import terminals, well, those everybody knows about, okay. The, uh, these other opportunities, uh, just think about every place where you've got cryogenic gas plants or new gas plants developing, Eagleford Shale, Marcellus, uh, Bakken, up in Canada, you know, those opportunities are many. Uh, there are already some existing cryogenic gas plants, like there, um, Exxon has one in a place called Shoot Creek. It's right, it's about 10 miles from o o Opal. Jordan and I went out there, it's like, man, this is the middle of nowhere, you know. <laughs> oh, there it is. You can see it for like 20 miles. In fact, I was driving with Jordan, I said, oh, we'll be there in five minutes. It's just, just a couple miles down the road. He said, no, that's 20 miles away, I'm telling you. And, and it's like, oh, we'll see. You know, he was right. <laughs> it was like, man, that thing, it looks like it's right there, but it was 20 miles away. You know, a bunch of antelope running around and stuff. Um, anyway, uh, so there, there, are, there are many opportunities you know, right here in the U.S., certainly in Canada, and ultimately all over the world. This other process, the one I really can't talk about, all over the world, and in and, and every major metropolitan market, okay? So in other words, we'll never, and, and, and existing facilities, so you don't have to worry about NIMBY because it's already in people's backyard. How can you say NIMBY to something that's already there, you know? So in any event, okay. Yeah, have you figured out how to get ice cream trucks to do this? <laughs> yeah, we're working on that. That's a big market, you know? Uh, that was that little asterisk over there. It was ice cream trucks. Okay, now, now we move to the really interesting I mean, all this was really cool, and this is all about, you know, saving Frito-Lay money and Coca-Cola money and, and Anheuser-Busch and, you know, Walmart. And if you believe it, if you're saving those guys money, it is going to save all of us money because, you know, the, the cost of their production and delivery and logistics eventually will find its way on the, the grocery counter prices. So even helping the big guys, you're going to help us because it lowers their cost of production. So, but that's... That doesn't interest people as much as, as, you know, well, what about my wallet? What about my wallet right with me right now? How can you do, what can you do for that? So, Jordan, let's go to the next slide. Well, I thought, pondered this long and hard. And um, as Bob knows, I've worked in a bunch of different industries. I worked in EMP. I worked for two big pipeline companies. I worked in merchant generation. I've, I've been in a bunch of different silos. And the thing about the energy industry, most people, they get in their little silo, and that's where they stay. And they really become great at their thing. And they know what the silo is that's next door, the ones that touch them, but they don't know about the ones that's, you know, like two or three silos removed. Well, I've been in all those silos, so I kind of have an idea of how things work, even in industries that, you know, at one time I didn't even work in those industries. So what I came up with um, is a, it's basically, it's my first new patented device. I've got an engineering degree from UT Austin, uh, so I've now got a patent applied for. And it's something we came up with, actually Jordan came up with. So I should give him credit for that. It's called Jeff. So if you don't like it, it's his fault. Uh, the Jeff unit. Now, the, uh, uh, there was, years ago, this little thing called the Phil unit, P-H-I-L. And 
And what it was was a little appliance that, that you put on your in your wall in your garage, and it's plumbed to your internal natural gas plumbing. You know, if you're on an LDC, that you know that that feeds your hot water heater and your clothes dryer and your stove and um, and your furnace. Okay, and all that little thing did was was fill your car up. Okay, and nothing else. Well, it's like well, that's not enough, and it was expensive. You know, and it, and it kind of broke down. It wasn't that reliable because it was it's, you know it was almost like handmade. So essentially. Like, well, what, let's, let's have more functionality. So what we, what we, what we have here is a, a much better quality microcompressor than the one, plus a buffer tank, okay? All the people that have done these little compression units for home use, or even like for the post office, what they do is you plug your vehicle in, and it's like an electric car. It's got to be there for six or eight hours if you want a full tank. You know, you can leave in, you know, with less than a full tank. But if you want a full tank, you know, you have to wait six or eight hours. And essentially, if you think about blowing up a balloon, when the balloon's completely flaccid, you can, you know, the light goes in the first breath, but by the time that balloon is full, the, 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 the fill rate is much less on the last breath than on the first. So, so these things start off at maybe two gallons an hour, and then that last, you know, that last hour, it's only 0.4. So it's, it's not a linear function, it's a nonlinear function, and that, that's a function of the pressure inside the tank in your car. Well, that's all well and good, but I said, well, shoot, if, if you're filling the tank up in your car, when your car's at home, couldn't you fill another tank that's there all the time when you're not home? Sure you could. And that way, when you come home, that tank's already full, and all you got to do is plug it in, and now you can fill your car in five minutes instead of eight hours. So that's a buffer tank, okay? So essentially, you know, with this, with this unit, you can, you, can, you can use the slow fill unit, what we call the time fill unit. Like if you plug your car in at night, it's got a shut off valve. It automatically shuts off. You won't be able to drive off and you know <laughs> pull the thing off the wall, okay? And, or you could plug it in and fill it up immediately, okay? That's 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 a big difference between our unit and, and and the others that have been tried. But the really big difference is that when that thing's not filling your car tank or your buffer tank, it's an available standby emergency generator and distributed generator. And it's a fuel cell, just like Bloom Energy, just like Google. You'd be just like Google, but better because cheaper. Now, Google's, Google's uh, distributed generation, uh, their, their um, fuel cell unit, the one they got from Bloom Energy, the ones, I should say, they have a whole array of them. They're very large. They're very expensive. They use all kinds of exotic metals. Well, you can essentially make a fuel cell on a much more miniature scale and using the same exotic metals, but only as a coating on where a very high quality steel, the, the plates, okay, where the chemical reaction actually takes place with the catalyst. You don't have to have that plate solid, that material. You can, there are electric, basically electrical plating methods where you can put the same material that acts as a catalyst on a very high quality piece of uh, stainless steel, okay? So that's a much cheaper way. And if you make these in sufficient numbers, then you can get the production cost down to where they're very reasonable. Uh, the other components, obviously the control and metering, there's all kinds of things about what the unit needs to know when it's filling your car, when it's filling the buffer tank, or when it's generating electricity, or sometimes it's doing nothing. And then the control and data acquisition, this thing will be able to talk to the grid. It'll be able to talk to a, a, a queasy, a, a qualifying service entity, like someone like, say, Tanaska, who's going to dispatch all these things. Anyway, so let's go to the next, next, next. Uh, um, you know, oh, and it needs to. Question. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I, we have we, we are literally the first one is being built at my undergraduate alma mater, Georgia Tech. So it'll 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 you know it'll have a, a good seal of approval from the Georgia Tech Research Institute, you know, which um, I think the only uh, public universities that do any more contract research in the scientific area are MIT and maybe Cal Poly. And Georgia Tech did over six hundred and fifty million dollars worth of contract research, and the vice provost who runs all that. Uh, was a classmate of mine when I was at Georgia Tech back in Estonia. So we're getting kind of the inside deal. So um, this this one here, this was the fill unit. That company was a Toronto-based company. American Honda actually owned half of it. A neat idea, very poor engineering execution, and the business model was even worse. So Honda said, we're not putting any more money. Boone Pickens made a run at it when, made a run at it when they went bankrupt. We kind of looked at it, but so I wasn't really, you know, didn't have a few million just laying around. And it actually got snapped up by an Italian NGV compression company called Imco. And they don't know what to do with it yet, but they, they keep making noises like they're going to bring it back. You know? Then there's a little company, I actually went up to Cleveland, uh, called Nat Gas Car. 
And they do two things. They do conversions. They just got uh, EPA approval on a Dodge Ram 4.7 liter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Time. All right. We've got to go fast. So anyway, um, uh, this one, all it does is fill up your car. Our unit, we think that we can get it, we, if we build sufficient volumes, we can do it for somewhere around $3,000 a unit. There's a $2,000 tax credit, okay? So anyway, so then it's really $1,000. But with our business model, we don't propose to sell it to you. You will just lease it from your LDC, okay? So, you know, people don't, oh, $1,000, I don't want to do that. Oh, $50 a month to, to Atmos or Atlanta Gaslight or Simbra? Oh, I can do that. Okay, and the fact is, if it's generating electricity, instead of having to pay them fifty dollars, if it generates enough electricity, you may get a check from Simbra instead of having from getting a bill, because if the amount of money that it makes as a generation unit exceeds your monthly lease deal, then they'll just rebate you the difference or give you a credit on your gas bill. What's the cost of the kilowatt? Uh, base, base. Well, I mean, I'm getting right to that. Let's go. Cause I, I gotta go quick because I'm not. Yeah. Okay, I have five minutes. Uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. Let's go to the next slide, Jordan. Uh, well, actually, before you do, uh, I was just saying it can be used as a distributed generation unit. Imagine if you, if, if this thing's a 5 kW unit, 10,000 of these is equal to the same as, as 50 megawatts. 10,000 of these is equal to a, a, a single LM6000 simple cycle. But it's better than an LM6000 simple cycle because an LM6000 simple cycle is 50 miles from town. It's got to go connect to the transmission grid. We are right in your house. If you are an ERCOT or PJM, a nodal market, you're going to get the highest price. There's no transmission loss because it's right at the point of consumption. Okay, So to answer your question, in a, in a, a peaking unit or a super peak electric situation, this thing will be completely competitive with any conventional good technology like LM6000 gas turbine in terms of its per kilowatt hour. So I would have to say, you know, at, 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 uh, because of the cost of delivery of the gas for the LDC is more expensive than what, you know, uh, um, uh, NRG is paying here, even considering the LNG tariff to deliver the gas versus buying it off the inter or interstate pipeline, it's still going to be, say, today in ERCOT, it would be seven or eight cents per kilowatt hour. Maybe nine. Very competitive. Okay, and, and the last time I looked, you couldn't fill your car up with an LM6000, so it's got all kinds of benefits. Uh, and most people can't afford to buy an LM6000. Um, we're saying an effective heat rate of about 10,000 BTU per kilowatt hour. There's an optional feature that we're looking at is, is also taking the waste heat from the, um, from the fuel cell to preheat your hot water. So then that, what you have then is what we call combined heat and power. That drives the heat rate down to about 9,000, you know, but there's a little extra capex. Okay. So, uh, now, this is an important point. Everybody's talking about, you know, about the renewables and, the, you know, the wind doesn't blow when you want it to blow and the sun doesn't uh, shine necessarily when you need it to shine. Well, the Jeff units will, will tremendously augment renewables. And, and I believe that we'll be able to do more renewables with these Jeff units, which are in people's households, than having to build a bunch of backup, you know, um, large-scale industrial gas turbines. So uh, uh, I guess the, the, the jury's out on that. But we're certainly looking at maybe having General Electric make this for us. And so all the business that we're going to poach from them as far as losing LM6000 orders, we'll be making these. So, you know, uh, and, and we'll be exporting these things all over the world, particularly to Japan, since they've got all this. They're, they're, they just lost 5% uh, of their total national uh, generation capacity with this nuclear mass. Uh, 